More than 100 years have passed since the 1894 British Raj Commission study of hashish smokers in India reported that cannabis use was harmless and sometimes even helpful. Numerous studies have since agreed, but it doesn't matter because weed isn't outlawed to protect anyone. It's outlawed to support a network of well-paid government agents, warriors in the war on drugs. And it's always been that way, ever since weed was added to the then small list of illegal drugs. Hello, welcome back. This is part two of our discussion on the war on drugs, and today we're going to pick up where we left off, around the turn of the century, 1900. Back then, the war on drugs didn't exist. Not yet. But some shots had already been fired. Maine instituted a few anti-alcohol laws in the 1850s. Then San Francisco passed its first racist laws aimed at Chinese immigrants who were smoking opium. That was around 1870. But the government couldn't have cared less about white folks who were drinking opium tincture, taking cocaine, or smoking weed. It was all legal at that point, and you could buy most of it at the local grocer. Nationwide alcohol prohibition didn't begin until 1920, and it only lasted 13 years, during which organized crime grew from a small nuisance to a permanent fixture of life in the United States. It didn't take long for us to realize that we'd made a huge mistake, and in 1933, we passed the 21st Amendment, re-legalizing alcohol nationwide. Organized crime took a big hit, and they probably would have been all but wiped out if all drugs had remained legal and regulated. But it was already too late, because a man named Harry Anslinger had weaseled his way into the machine at that point, and he was going to make a career and a legacy off designing and instituting a war on drugs that would last at least a hundred years. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable, dope-peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. And it's no joke to call it a war. It costs as much as any other war we've ever fought. But there's zero ground gained, ever. There's no drug that's ever been wiped out by the war on drugs. Our prisons are currently packed with drug users who return at a rate of around 80% when they're released, and they're expensive to house, more than $40,000 a year in some jurisdictions. The war on drugs has always been a complete joke, but those who make a good living from it have always pretended not to notice. And so it grinds on, killing and locking up hundreds of thousands of U.S. citizens every single year. Anti-drug laws did not exist at the federal level until the end of 1914, when the Harrison Tax Act outlawed drugs like heroin and cocaine and sparked a fire that would become a never-ending war. But the government moved slowly, and it wasn't until 15 years later, in 1930, that the long-awaited Federal Bureau of Narcotics was established. It would later become the DEA the Drug Enforcement Administration. And here's where things got weird. The pendulum of U.S. policy had swung hard and fast towards prohibition of all drugs, but only because the prohibitionists had great timing and a lot of luck. A lot of things had to fall into place for a war against drugs to even be a possibility. And when that started to happen near the turn of the 20th century, the anti-drug warriors were ready. They'd already been preaching their stigma-filled messages for years, but nobody was listening back then because those who were using drugs were heroes. But by the early 1900s, things were changing. While the U.S. Civil War vets who'd been major consumers of heroin, cocaine, and morphine were dying of old age, the prospect of globalization was also becoming a reality, threatening the sanctity of white supremacy in the United States. Lots of people of color were beginning to move to areas that had been mostly white prior to that, and they were not always remaining poor and destitute like white supremacy demanded. Some of them were getting good jobs, opening businesses, and even managing white employees. What kind of white supremacy was that? The first anti-drug laws worked because they focused on non-white people and because the public no longer thought of drug users as war vets. That image was replaced with one tailor-made by Anslinger and his goons, designed to appeal to our oldest national characteristic in the United States, white supremacy. Our racism got the best of us, and before we could slam on the brakes, booze was outlawed, and other drugs weren't far behind. But like I said, it didn't take us long to realize we'd made a huge mistake. Nobody quit drinking when alcohol sales were outlawed, even though the government no longer got a dime of tax money off of all those liquor sales. That money instead went to organized crime. If you remember from part one, timing was important here as well. A big chunk of the federal government's revenue once came from taxing alcohol, but once income tax was instituted in 1913, 
that money was no longer important, and by 1920, the federal government was set up to go after drugs and alcohol. Instead of taxing the drugs and alcohol and paying for government operations with those monies, this new plan involved taxing everyone to pay drug warriors massive salaries to attack our fellow citizens. And it worked, but only with drugs. Alcohol took another route. Thirteen years after nationwide prohibition began, it was ended with the passage of the 21st Amendment in 1933. Between those two dates, as prohibition was becoming less popular by the day, the man I mentioned a minute ago, Harry Anslinger, wrote nepotism into the position as head of a newly created Bureau of Narcotics. But it looked like he was too late. Three years later, alcohol would be legalized, and the rumblings were already audible at that point. It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to estimate the benefit that will come to this country from the lesson taught to the coming generation to make it their business to see that no such matter as this is ever again made the subject of federal constitutional law. Harry knew right away that he would only have a war to fight with users of cocaine and heroin. These drugs were illegal, and there were plenty of people using them, but nowhere near enough to rationalize the existence of an entire government bureau, and certainly not enough to begin a worldwide war of the sort Harry was looking to start. Anslinger was about to lose his job, so he worked up a solution. He declared a war against all drugs, and importantly, those who use and sell them. And he started with marijuana, which he spelled and pronounced with a hard H, marijuana. This probably seemed bizarre to much of his staff, at least to those who didn't understand how racism and white supremacy work. Harry was looking to ban a drug that was still commonly sold in mail-order catalogs, advertised with the name cannabis tincture. It grew in people's backyards, and nobody seemed all that concerned about it. But by renaming the drug and emphasizing that H, marijuana, he associated it with Mexican immigrants, a group who already made many white citizens feel uncomfortable. And by lying about the effects, claiming it made users criminally insane, Harry gave racist white folks a way to express that racism without admitting it was racism. Fear of drug users who, incidentally, were always constructed as non-white threats to social order. If you're watching this video as part of my communication class, then you won't be surprised to learn how Harry pulled off this trick of turning an entire country against drugs. He did the same thing as all successful politicians in the history of politics. He got the press to do the work for him. U.S. consumers have always been intrigued by salacious headlines and gory stories. The Bureau of Narcotics was more than happy to write him up. Not only was Harry a loudmouth bigot who was repeatedly urged to retire after using racial slurs, but he also published numerous articles in a tone that was much more PC, so to speak. He used what later came to be known as dog whistles, coded shoutouts to readers who harbored racist resentment and needed a way to express it without getting yelled at by their liberal kids. This is Victor Licata, one of Harry's favorite go-to cases for explaining the dangers of drug use. Victor's parents were first cousins, so he may have had a genetic disorder, and he definitely suffered from severe mental illness throughout his life, long before he murdered his family with an axe in 1933. When authorities found him the next day, he was huddled in a corner in a back room, and he swore his parents had chopped off his arms and tried to shove broom handles into the holes. This clearly wasn't weed talking. Victor had a long history of mental illness, and he later killed himself, along with another inmate, at a mental hospital some years later. Again, it's hard to imagine they were giving him weed, or even if they were, that it made him violent and psychotic enough to commit a crime like that. But Harry ignored all that common sense stuff, and instead provided a story to press organizations which they couldn't pass up. He said that Victor got stoned, lost control, and then murdered his entire family, and that this could happen to anyone who used marijuana even once. Your uncle, the weapon was found on you. Why did you do it? I, I had a terrible dream. People were trying to hack off my arms. They were sniffing around, trying to kill me. I recognize one my uncle. I had to kill him. Before they killed me. I had to kill him. Can't you understand? I had to kill him. 
Back then, the press was newspapers, and the teaser was the headline. Photographs were grainy and hard to capture, so newspapers usually resorted to cartoons or to diagrams. But Harry began providing high-quality photographs to go along with the salacious stories of drug mayhem and cop heroism. And since the stories came straight from the mouths of government agents, reporters could print them without doing much follow-up or fact-checking. This was, after all, Uncle Sam. So Harry leaned hard on the media. His ability to play on white folks' underlying racial fears became his calling card. Without any legitimate evidence to back up his claims, Anslinger testified before Congress and claimed that marijuana was a gateway drug that would make users criminally insane. He treated the House Committee on Appropriations to a racist rant, saying he'd been told of, quote, colored students at the University of Minnesota partying with female students and getting their sympathy with stories of racial persecution. Result? Pregnancy. He informed the country, falsely, that black folks accounted for 10% of the total population, but 60% of addicted people. In his 1937 article in the American magazine called Marijuana, Assassins of Youth, he claimed that the number of murders, suicides, robberies, criminal assaults, holdups, burglaries, and deeds of maniacal insanity marijuana causes every year, especially among the young, can only be conjectured. This dude knew media, and he knew his audience. In 1937, Harry got his wish. The Marijuana Tax Act was passed into law, requiring anyone who possessed marijuana to obtain a stamp from the government. And with the government unwilling to issue any stamps, Anslinger's agents could arrest anyone who had marijuana. Harry's tax act would stand as law until 1969, when Timothy Leary would get it thrown out, only to be replaced by even stricter legislation, the 1970 Drug Abuse Prevention Act. While Anslinger was the Trump of his era, the blowhard loudmouth who didn't mind being people, called a racist. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some... Alongside him came a wave of anti-drug warriors loaded down with cash and willing to spend it. Reefer Madness actually began as a private production aimed at a religious audience. It was picked up and popularized by a mainstream production company. It became the framework for generations of anti-drug public service announcements, which were packed with fear-based lies and claims about how dangerous drugs are. This is a clip from a film called Drug Addiction, released in 1951. In recent years, there has been a shocking increase in drug addiction among young people, often in their teens, who take up the habit without the slightest understanding of the living nightmare they are so unthinkingly walking into. To get the illegal drugs, they are forced to deal with criminals who prey on those least able to defend themselves. And to find money for their expensive habit, they often turn to crime themselves. And you might notice a genealogical link to more contemporary anti-drug PSAs. They honed the recipe throughout Anslinger's early years, and by the 1960s, they had it down. The drug warriors know what scares us so bad that we'll come out of our pockets to pay for a war against our own people. No one ever says, I want to be a junkie when I grow up. Don't let drugs get in the way of your dreams. That's crime generally, but also other things, like losing your looks if you're a woman. There goes the family, she's got a new friend. There goes the looks, this is the end. Or losing the respect you get from your kids if you're a father. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You, all right? I learned it by watching you. Or losing your social connections if you're a young person. It's all about tickling that deep Freudian terror you have that you won't live up to the expectations society places upon you. Anslinger was commissioner of narcotics for 32 years, until 1962. And during that time, he crafted a double standard that would become business as usual. Strange when Billie Holiday wouldn't stop singing Strange Fruit, a song about southern lynchings, he took it personally and unleashed his agents on her for the rest of her life. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the trees. Billy died chained to a hospital bed after the federal government, under Harry's orders, had her methadone withdrawn to torture her with detox, even as she lay dying of cancer. 
Harry always claimed to hate drug users and addicted people, and Billie Holiday's treatment is evidence that he probably did. But whenever white folks suffered from addiction, Harry's reaction was way different. When he found out that Judy Garland was struggling with addiction, she played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Harry summoned her to his office and suggested she take a vacation. When he discovered his friend, Senator Joe McCarthy, was addicted to opiates, he not only kept it quiet, he provided him a legal supply, courtesy of the government. And even Anslinger himself used daily doses of heavy opiates to treat a painful condition called angina. He was a racist hypocrite, and if he hadn't succeeded in starting an unnecessary war on drugs and drug users, we might not be in a place where right now, 79,000 drug users are dying of overdoses every single year in the United States. But a century after Harry's egomaniacal war began, it still wages on, more expensive and expansive every single year. As the 1960s came to an end, the Nixon-Reagan era was about to kick off, and the war on drugs, which had already exploded into a massive machine of torture, was about to ramp up yet again. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I have asked the Congress to provide the legislative authority and the funds to fuel this kind of an offensive. Nixon took office in 1969, and he immediately started throwing cash at the war on drugs. He gained support using the same tricks as Harry. They all did. Nixon and Reagan and every politician since has attached intoxication to criminality and then duct taped both onto people of color and poor people, groups whom many fear already. And as the machine grew, it acquired more and more employees, and every one of them became dependent on its continuation. Their livelihoods depend on it, their careers, their ability to feed their families, their social standings in the community. All of these things now rely on the war on drugs not only persisting, but expanding year after year, forever. I want to end with a story that reveals the government's determination to expand the war on drugs, no matter how unconstitutional or torturous it becomes. Timothy Leary was a Harvard professor who many of you may have heard of. He popularized the phrase, turn on, tune in, and drop out. And in 1965, he almost got marijuana legalized. You drop out of high school, drop out of college, drop out of graduate school, Turn on, tune in, drop out. Leary was a rock star. He believed that psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin held great therapeutic potential. And in the 50 years that have passed since Leary's work was shut down, researchers have confirmed that he was indeed correct. And some encouraging evidence is already showing up. They're incredibly beneficial in the treatment of PTSD, addiction, anxiety, depression, and even end-of-life fears related to death. So the story goes like this. Timothy Leary is headed to Mexico for a vacation with his family during the holiday season in 1965. But he's turned back at the border. Mexico won't let him in. So as he heads back to the U.S. side, he gets stopped by U.S. border agents. And when he explains to them that he never actually entered Mexico, they ask to search his car, claiming they smelled marijuana. So they search the car and find some weed, not a ton, but enough to lock Leary up for violation of this Marijuana Tax Act, which by this point is almost 30 years old. And Leary's convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he appeals, and the case goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Leary's argument focused on the way that the Tax Act was written to require disclosure of his marijuana purchase, which was illegal in both New York, where he bought the weed, and Texas, where he was arrested. If he had attempted to get a stamp in either state, he would have been violating that state's drug possession laws by revealing his illegal purchase of the weed. This, he argued, violated the U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment Clause, which guarantees all citizens the right of not being compelled to incriminate ourselves. The Supreme Court agreed, and they ruled the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act unconstitutional. But it didn't matter. Leary was no match for the heavy-handed government, and shortly after he won the federal case, he was sentenced to 10 years for having two joint roaches, which he claims were planted by the arresting officer. So you might be wondering, if Leary won and got the federal marijuana laws thrown out, then why is marijuana still illegal today at the federal level? 
And in fact, this would have been a great opportunity for the government to reassess the war against this plant and those who use it. But they weren't willing to let the matter go that easy. And shortly after the Supreme Court ruled the Marijuana Tax Act unconstitutional, Congress got together and passed updated drug laws, including the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, which introduced the Schedule 1 through 5 classification that most of us know today. And instead of taking this opportunity to put marijuana low on the list, somewhere where it might be studied or prescribed for medical purposes, Congress listed weed as Schedule 1 as among the most dangerous and the most restricted class of drugs with high abuse potential and no recognized medical use. Cocaine and methamphetamine are both Schedule 2. Ketamine is Schedule 3, and Xanax is Schedule 4. They're all considered less dangerous and addictive than marijuana, if you believe the federal government. And because of that, millions of taxpayer dollars continue to make their way into the pockets of drug warriors, people who might not even have a job if not for Harry's bigotry. Part 3 will pick up with Nixon's election, and the incredible trick he pulled of expanding a war that was already bursting at the seams. Nixon invented the contemporary prison industrial complex, and he used the same tricks as Anslinger had 50 years earlier. 